Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Archit Tishadri. You're watching We On World is One News. Time now is 9.30 in the morning in New York, 2.30 in London, and 7 p.m. here in New Delhi. Tonight, our big focus is on the U.K. elections as voters head to the polls. Who are the candidates and what are the key issues? This hour, we focus on those topics. Coming up at 8 o'clock, we focus on terror and Brexit. And at 9 on Gravitas, we'll go in-depth on the big picture and all the hot-button issues. But first, to tonight's discussion. Voting is underway now in the UK for the elections. More than 46 million people are eligible to vote for 650 members of parliament. The voting started at 7 o'clock in the morning local time. It'll wrap up at 10 in the evening. Both Prime Minister Theresa May with the Conservative Party, as well as the opposition leader with the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, have now voted. The last-minute opinion polls show that Theresa May is on course to increase her majority in Parliament. Of the six polls published, two showed the Conservatives widening their lead over Labour, while two showed a narrowing stance, and the other two were unchanged. However, at the other end of the spectrum, other polling firms said the Conservatives' lead stood at just one percentage point, which called into question whether Theresa May could get a majority at all. Polling experts also say the main difference between the polls suggests a tighter race is largely because of varying estimates of how many young voters, who typically support Labour, are likely to get out and vote. The polls are taking place days after two deadly terror attacks by ISIS militants. I did think about Brexit, uh, the environment, um, the economy as well, inequality. Jeremy Corbyn is fair, honest, brilliant. He cares about everybody. Um, he, thinks, he thinks that we need good housing, health care, education for everybody. I voted to remain in. It didn't work out much as no one did not come up with uh, any specific answer, but I have to vote someone. Jeremy is a very nice guy, and he got good policy because of that I'm voting for Labour. And since I came in this country, I'm voting for Labour. All right, to get the perspective on this segment, we're now joined live by Gareth Brown, a journalist from London, as well as Alan Rosling, a chairman at the Griffith Growth Partners Limited from New Delhi, and Mandy Clark, our bureau chief from London. Thank you to all of our guests. Let me first start with Mandy. Mandy, you've been out there looking and talking to people, especially in South Hall, a huge uh, population of South Asians there. What is on voters' minds? I understand it's a little bit rainy out there as well. It is a bit rainy out here. Um, earlier this morning, I was indeed in South Hall getting an opinion. It's a very safe uh, labor constituency, um, but many people are talking about uh, issues that matter to them, personal issues like the state of the health care system. That was uh, one, of the, one of the issues that came up quite a bit, and that would be where labor is their strongest. I'm currently in Harrow, which is another uh, big South Asian com uh, community here, uh, but it is a conservative area. And uh, what we're hearing is immigration and Brexit is the, the main issues of conversation here. All right, let me go to uh, Garrett Brown also standing by. Garrett, you know, quite a lot of issues on voters' minds. Certainly the terror attacks that happened last week bring the issue of national security back in the spotlight. How crucial, how do you think that will resonate with viewers as they cast their ballots? Well, I think it's been absolutely critical, particularly since Saturday's attack at London Bridge. Um, we've seen uh, the, the discourse almost entirely dominated by, by issues of policing, security, terrorism, uh, even to a lesser degree foreign policy. Um, this, was this was traditionally seen as the kind of strong area f for the Conservative Party. They were the party of security and national security. But, um, you know, given these attacks and, and, and Theresa May's track record as, as Home Secretary, which she was for six years before she became Prime Minister, um, you know, there's been questions raised. So, so we're seeing kind of traditional understandings of the different parties and the electoral makeup of the UK seriously challenged. 
All right, Gareth and Mandy, uh, thank you for your discussion. We'll continue to come back to you throughout this special broadcast, but we also got a chance to uh, uh, talk to other folks who had a lot on their minds when it came to the polls and the votes. Well, it's been nearly a year since the UK actually voted to leave the European Union. This as the surprise Brexit vote that happened last June. A lot of people are still unsure about the economy and other key issues. So the big question at this point is, will the new leader be able to unite the UK? Um, everybody just wants to be, uh, they want a good outcome for business, for their families and for their children and uh, the economy's got to come first. I mean there are other important issues, obviously the, uh, the mobility of labour is going to be key as well. Um, everybody wants Brexit, if we're going to have to have it, to work. Um, but what, work, what working really means and how we get there uh, I think is a tough uh, road ahead. Well, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment because nobody really knows how it's going to Im impact. But I think uh, what has become very clear is that, uh, you know, obviously we had, it was nearly a 50-50. So half, uh, you know, we have a very divided country in terms of how they feel um, that the country is, is involved in Europe or, or not involved in Europe. Um, I think there's a big, big difference between London and outside of London. Um, London is sort of almost like a country on its own within a country. Um, and maybe people who are not from London don't, you know, they, they feel that they're, they're, their views and their, their opinions are not being uh, taken into consideration. So I suspect that's probably why we ended up voting out. We're almost 12, 12 months in after the vote and we still haven't been told what Brexit looks like. We still don't know what the government's negotiation. It's still a huge question. And I think it's extraordinary that we can, we can be put in this position where this is probably going to be one of the, the most pivotal political acts of, that my generation ever experiences. And to be left in the dark so much and for our politicians to either not know what we're doing or not be prepared to tell us is really quite extraordinary. And it, it angers me and it annoys me and it, it really makes me despair quite a lot. All right, we got a perspective from some of the business leaders from the UK about what is on voters' minds. Let's go back to our guest. Uh, let me start with Mandy. Mandy, you know, we heard from uh, one, of those, uh, uh, one of those entrepreneurs who talked about the sentiment being very different in London than it is in the rest of the UK when it came to the Remain and Leave camp. Is that still the case? Is there still a lot of division when it comes to the British? Well, yes, uh, London and the rest of the UK are very much seem to be almost two different countries. Uh, London is a powerhouse economically and tends to to lead the rest of the country much to their chagrin. And parts of the country were neglected. And I think that's where where we had this London bubble, where most of London just simply believed they, they're going to vote remain, the country will vote remain and was quite shocked to find that, that the rest of the country really didn't feel the same way. Uh, so, you know, what happens in London isn't necessarily indicative of the mood of the rest of the country. All right, let's go back to uh, Gareth Brown. Gareth, we heard from them talking about Brexit and how it was a huge political shakeup, something that this generation really defines, something many people just didn't really expect. The whole uh, premise of Brexit, how is that going to play out on voters' minds as they head to the polls? Still another eight hours or so left. Well, there's definitely a lot of uncertainty surrounding Brexit. So, so um, it's not easy to say if it's going to push people one way or the other. But what it has done is it's, it's, tra it's challenged traditional party alliances, um, conservative uh, MPs who have, have or conservative voters who, who were pro-Remain, Labour MPs who were who were pro-Brexit. Um, so now we're seeing this kind of traditional right versus left divide in the UK being completely mixed up. We have conservative MPs who were pro-Remain, who are considering voting for uh, pro-Remain MPs from other parties and vice versa with the Labour Party. It's, it's widely believed that um, uh, and rumoured that, that Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party, was actually kind of pro-Brexit. He's never really said which way he voted. A lot of people believe he, he voted to exit the EU. And considering his party was kind of traditionally seen of this seen as this beacon of of of, of internationalism and 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 really anchored our, our well the united kingdom's position within the european union um it's it's, it's challenging people in, in all sorts of ways that previous elections really really haven't 
All right, we'll come back to our discussion in just a short moment, but let's explain to our viewers uh, the perspective. Why exactly are people in the UK voting again? Well, in 2015, David Cameron won a majority. Cameron then resigned after last year's Brexit referendum. The polls called to strengthen Brexit negotiations. Well, England is going to vote three years before it was actually scheduled to vote. Well, let's also talk about what exactly is at stake in these snap polls. Well, Britain's Brexit negotiations are set to begin in June. It is a big win for the Tories. That means May could help the UK negotiate. A loss for Theresa May could mean that the Brexit strategy remains wide open. While well, irrespective of who wins, the UK to exit the EU within the next two years by 2019, as Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty has already been triggered. So let's also talk about who stands where on some of these uh, key issues when we talk about the polls there in the UK. So the key issues on hand, of course, Brexit, as we mentioned, the economy, the education, some of the important hot but button issues the Labour and the Conservatives are now dealing with. So breaking this up, we'll start with Brexit first. When it comes to the Conservatives, they are back clean. They want a break from the EU and they want to leave the EU's single market cap when it comes to migration from the EU. Well, going to Labour, well, they back the conditional EU exit of uh, the UK to stay connected to the EU routes, also to encourage the flow of services. All right, switching gears now to the economy. How do the two parties defer? Conservatives say they want to levy higher taxes, they want to promote local companies and cut down by migrations by two-thirds. So an interesting perspective when it comes to the job markets, especially those on visas. Going to labor, this is how they view the economy. The Labour Party says they want to increase public spending via PSUs, they want government-run railways, as well as postal service increases and to tax the super wealthy. And last but not least, another hot button issue, the topic of education. Conservatives, well, they are backing for tuition-free colleges. Labor, on the other hand, they want free education in universities. All right, let's go back to our guests. Three key topics, Brexit, the economy, and education. Mandy, we'll start with you. The economy, how important of a role is the economy going to shape and play a role as voters head to the polls? That's really unusual, especially for general elections, is normally the economy stupid is, is a common refrain, but it hasn't been. And, it, and largely, it's the, the nature of where these elections happened in right before the Brexit negotiations and, of course, uh, with two major terror attacks during the, the election period. So the economy hasn't factored in it, which is uh, really surprising when it, and unusual when it comes to an election campaign. All right, what about, uh, Garrett, let's talk to you about the education impact of this, another important issue there. How is that going to shape out and perhaps influence young voters? Um, well, definitely there's um, traditionally very low turnout when it comes to younger voters, but um, kind of since, since David Cameron's um, coalition government came to power several years back, there have been pretty significant cuts to education, um, university uh, fees tripled, um, and even primary schools, secondary schools have all seen cuts of, of differing types. Um, so what we're seeing is, is, a, is a battle over a, a battleground when it comes to education. Labour have promised to, to make universities free for all again, which is going to be a very expensive policy. But it's, it's clear that's aimed at, at getting young people out to vote. I mean, it's usually kind of less than 40 percent of young people turn out to vote. They, all, they overwhelmingly vote for Labour. Um, and, and, you know, to be honest, the polls have been looking very, very bad. They have, they have, they have got better, but for Labour, they've been kind of looking bad for the last two years. Um, but, but one thing that might allow Labour to upset the polls is if they can get some, some tremendous turnout from, from the youth in the United Kingdom um, that will overwhelmingly uh, benefit, benefit their party. Likewise, the, you know, the, the Conservatives get traditionally their votes from older people. So they're pushing the get the vote out message to pensioners. Um, and people, people above the age of 40 or 50. So, so we're kind of seeing both these two main parties fight over getting their, their vote out and, and education when it comes to young people is, is critical for any chance of Labour success. All right, let's now go over to Alan Rosling, joining us, the chairman at Griffith Growth Partners Limited. Uh, Alan, thanks for joining us. My question to you is when it comes to the immigrant, the minorities, which party do they typically tend to side with? Is there a preference between the Labour or the Conservatives? 
Yeah, uh, good evening. I mean, traditionally, um, uh, new new British people, so to speak, if I can call them that, have tended to support the Labour Party over the last 20, 30 years. And the Conservatives have been trying for many years to convert people they, they see as natural Conservatives in many respects uh, and have an increased stake in among many of the communities that have come to the UK uh, in kind of middle-class values that the Tories stand for. Um, but so far, frankly, the Tories have had limited success. Maybe there is, um, the last couple of elections, some, some evidence that an increasing number of new British people or recent immigrants are beginning to become Tory, but it's still very, very largely Labour. All right, well, certainly in the running as well are some key Indians, some South Asians in the fray. Let's take a look at them and profile some of those candidates. We have Preeti Patel, a 45-year-old with the Conservative Party. We have Alok Sharma, a 45-year-old, also with the Conservative Party. We have Rishi Sunak, a 37-year-old with the Conservative Party as well. Valeria Vaz, a 62-year-old with the Opposition Labour Party. Suela Fernandez, 37-year-old with the Conservatives. These are some of the front runners. Reshim Kotecha, a 28-year-old with the Conservative Party. You have Amit Jogi, a 30-year-old with the Conservative Party as well. Earlier on, we spoke to Jessica Taneja, who brings us a profile of the issues the candidates represent. Well, we're looking at uh, the main candidates of the of the four parties that are in the forefront, starting with Theresa May. She is known to be a hardcore conservative, a true blood Tory, who was earlier the Home Secretary, known for making her rigid policies on immigration as well as implementing, in fact, the hard Brexit, as what she calls it. Uh, she is one of the leading uh, uh, runners at the moment for uh, in the British elections. In fact, many of the polls have suggested that the Labour Party under her is gaining a lead. And moving on, we do have, in fact, other uh, you know, candidates as well, looking at Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader. The X-factor politician is what he's called, has emerged stronger with time. And in fact, when the election process had started, he was concerned that the party would not really do well. Remember, last time under Ed Miliband's leadership, the Labour Party had performed poorly, a bare second with a marginal fall. But with Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour Party feels stronger. He is against hard Brexit, says he wants to negotiate uh, great Brexit deals with the European Union and would also hope to strengthen the NHS. And moving on to Tim Farron, the Liberal Democrat. He supports the single market. He's also known as someone who's emerged very, very strongly for the Liberal Democrats. Earlier, uh, a lot of conspicuous theories around him. But in fact, he supports uh, the single market and wants uh, uh, free trade with the EU and hardly neglects Brexit. He also wants another second, in fact, Brexit referendum, if it can be called. Also, he backs the Leave campaign last year. He was completely against the United Kingdom Independence Party and the Conservatives for holding both the Scottish referendum and the Brexit referendum. And moving on, we have Nicola Sturgeon, who she is uh, the leader, in fact, of the Scottish National Party, known for her nationalistic policies for the Scottish people. She, in fact, wanted to trigger another Scottish referendum with the UK. Is against Brexit because, remember, Scotland didn't vote for Brexit. 62% of people in Scotland did not really agree with, EU, with, the, with Britain exiting the EU. And, in fact, she is leading the Scottish National Party into the fourth election. And uh, she's also Scotland's Deputy First Minister and Health Secretary. So her past has been strong, trying to negotiate deals with Theresa May. Doesn't really support the Conservatives or the Tories, has an independent stance and hopes that the Scottish people would vote for SNP and not the Lib Dems or the Labour Party or the Conservatives. All right, let's go back to our guest joining us. Let me go to uh, Mandy Clark. We have a question, actually, from uh, our Facebook viewer. We're live on Facebook as well. Ashish wanted to find out the impact on South Asia. What will the candidates bring to India and South Asia, specifically when it comes to trade deals and visas? So, Mandy, uh, you were in uh, uh, some of the key South Asian areas uh, talking to uh, voters there. What is on their minds and which of these candidates could be better for South Asia? Well, I spoke to the MP of Elian South Paul, who's uh, running for re-election, um, and he made it clear that it, bilateral relations with India would be beneficial under Labour. He said he pointed to international students; they want to up the numbers of international students. Labour Party, of course, the Conservative Party 
has called on closing down those numbers. So he thinks um, the Labour Party would be the, of course he would, but he was saying how that there's many ways they can reaffirm those links and ties with India. Um, the Conservatives uh, have made one of the first stops Theresa made as the new Prime Minister, of course, was to India to reaffirm the ties. She had made it clear that um, it would be important, especially in the Brexit negotiation, to to uh, recommit to those uh, ties outside of Brexit and um, tie up those trade deals. So certainly the Conservatives have made overtures to India as well. All right, let me ask you the same question to uh, Gareth joining us as well. Uh, Gareth, uh, uh, what is the sentiment like there with some of the uh, immigrant and the minority communities, specifically what would this could mean to South Asia? Um, well, when it comes to South Asia, um, the Brexit referendum last year, we, we had a, there was certainly a, a, a movement a pro-Brexit movement that wanted Britain to come out of the EU, but but then develop this kind of outward-looking um, uh, ideology, which certainly focused on kind of Commonwealth countries and countries with which Britain had a strong historical link. India is clearly uh, top of that list, um, and so there was there was certainly a line of argument that Brexit might help us recalibrate. Uh, British British economic interests and and we'd be able to engage further with with, with South Asian countries, um, but then at the same time we've seen um, you know the Conservatives have really kind of clamped down on things like uh, student international student visas and that's probably likely to continue. It's a very very easy way of cutting immigration. Um, so so on the one hand it might it might might play bad for for, for the visa situation for for immigration, but on the other hand we could see um, we could see a, a kind of economic renaissance between uh, Britain and, and South Asia countries, South Asian countries, particularly India, I would say. All right. Another big hot button issue certainly is the issue of cyber security and data privacy in the United Kingdom. How is all of that going to shape out and play a role? We on Sahil Maniktala explains. You know, after that uh, recent uh, global cyber attack that pretty much disrupted the National Health Service in the UK, the issue of cybersecurity has taken center stage in these elections. Also, let's not forget the recent terror attack in London and the recent terror attack in Manchester. I mean, this has basically brought the debate forward whether the government should have mass surveillance power or not. Now, in this election, we have three parties contesting for the elections. We have the Conservatives, we have the Labour Party, and we have the Lib Dems. And all three of them believe that they have the right policies that will change the online system. But let's first start with the Conservative Party and let's take a look at what their first uh, policy actually is. Now, uh, Conservatives have the most to say about this situation. Uh, in fact, so much so that they mentioned the word privacy six times in their manifesto. And they basically want to pledge a new data privacy law, which is basically, uh, they're saying that it will change the fundamentals of how online data privacy actually takes place. Now, the issue here here is that we actually don't know what this uh, new law is all about, what it entails, how it will actually shape up. Uh, all we do know is, and this brings me to my second point, that in uh, uh, 2018 the general data protection uh, regulation will come up. If you can just quickly show that on the graphic, that's the next pointer. Yeah, so that's the general uh, data protection regulation 2018. It comes uh, into force in May 2018 and the issue with this is that basically uh, what will happen is that any uh, company or organization that uh, handles consumer data has to comply with this regulation. Now we don't know how the data privacy law that the Conservatives are uh, you know, pushing for will uh, comply with this. So a lot of uncertainty in that area. So a lot of uncertainty on both those two fronts. Uh, now let's move over to the third thing that we do know that the Conservatives want and that is government access to encrypted data. Now what the Conservative Party is saying they're basically saying that look we want access to tech platforms uh, like WhatsApp and we want a uh, backdoor access to people's private data, which is going to open up basically a whole can of worms because, again, it brings uh, forward the debate uh, about national security versus online privacy. So it's yet to be seen how uh, the Conservatives will actually end up achieving that. Now let's look at the final point, uh, the final promise from the Labour Party. They promise online safety for children, and this has to be the most boldest promise by the Conservatives. Uh, they're basically going to enforce, if they come back into power, they will uh, uh, enforce uh, uh, government authorities uh, and also social media platforms uh, to basically uh, 
to delete all the profiles of anyone who turns 18. This is, they're saying this will better help, uh, you know, keep children much more safer. But this is, you know, a very tall order because you will have to basically delete the social uh, user profiles of millions of people across various social media platforms. So again, a very tall order and how they will achieve this is, again, is yet to be seen and it seems very dubious at this stage. Now let's uh, move on to uh, the next party and that is uh, the Labour Party. and. The Labour Party's policies, you know, are somewhat very opaque and, you know, not very transparent, uh, not really clear because they're basically saying that they want to appoint a digital ambassador. Now, that doesn't, you know, give us a lot to go with because all we know at this stage is that this digital ambassador will coordinate with uh, technology companies uh, when it comes to dealing with national security, but it doesn't say what sort of power the digital ambassador will have. It doesn't say what sort of influence the digital ambassador will have. Uh, now, the second point uh, that the second promise that they're uh, making is they want to apply investigatory power when necessary. Now this is in line with basically what the Conservatives want as well but in this case it's not mandatory. What the Labour Party is saying that we will only initiate investigatory powers when and only when there is a threat to national security. So that's pretty much the Labour Party there for you. Now let's move to the final party and that's the uh, Liberal Democrats and they seem to be on the completely different end of the spectrum here. Uh, they're basically uh, proposing to create a digital bill of rights that will essentially end uh, the government's mass surveillance rights. They said they don't want any sort of government interference with people's uh, private data. So they're all up for protecting people's private data. Uh, and more importantly than that, uh, they're against backdrop encryption policy, something that the Conservatives are fighting very hard for. So in a nutshell, those are all the policies of all the respected parties uh, who are contesting in these elections. Now, who you go for is really up to you. If you think that terrorism is such a big uh, situation that you're okay with the government uh, to encroach upon your privacy laws, then, you know, by all means, vote for for the conservative. If you don't want that, if you think your uh, right to freedom, your right to privacy is so essential, then by all means vote for the Lib Dems. And if you're undecided, you can, you know, always vote for Labour. But the point here is you do have to vote. You do have to go out and vote. And I'm not just saying this uh, because I'm a British citizen. I'm saying this because your vote matters. It makes a difference. Because this election, let's face it, is not about personalities. This election is about policies. So make sure you make your vote uh, known and make sure that you do it right because it will change the future. This is Sahil Maniktala for Vion. All right, let's go back to our discussion. Now let me go back to our guest joining us. We'll start with Alan Rosling. Alan, cybersecurity, national security, certainly on the agenda, a hot topic after two recent attacks on UK soil. In fact, three already this year. How important is that going to shape whether or not voters pick Labour or Conservative or perhaps another party altogether? Okay, I'm, I'm actually based in Asia. I'm, I'm speaking to you from Delhi. So it's very difficult to judge the mood of the country from here. But, you know, we have, as a country have been through terrorism for the last 50 years. And I was, I was brought up in, in the UK under attack from the Irish, the IRA. Um, and what we've seen from the recent spate of terrorism is nothing as intense as what we've been through before. So frankly, I think the British are pretty phlegmatic. Yes, of course, it will affect, um, you know, uh, at the margin, people will be more careful. The government, no doubt, whichever party comes into power, will um, seek additional powers. Uh, Theresa May has already laid out what she would like to do. The Labour Party has been a bit more woolly. I don't think it's the core issue of this election, frankly. All right, let me go back to uh, Gareth Brown there, standing by as well. Gareth, you know, it certainly was a bit of a surprise when Theresa May called for those snap elections, the snap polls. And uh, perhaps uh, she did, uh, you know, was very confident. But those uh, polls recently show that margin is slipping. Why is that the case? Why do we see such uh, numbers uh, drastically change as uh, uh, the election day gets closer? Look, Th Theresa May wasn't the only one confident that she would win a huge victory. I think um, a lot of independent analysts thought she was going to win by a huge landslide. And even people in the Labour Party, a lot of MPs there were kind of in despair. We saw a lot of very, very talented MPs standing down before the, when, when the election was announced because they f thought that their party was going to get a drubbing. Um, but to go back to your question, why why has that faced? I mean, I think it's a combination of things. I, I definitely think the terrorism factor, the, the two successful attacks, or the two attacks that have been carried out during the election campaign have played massively on people's minds, and they've, they've questioned her legitimacy as this kind of strong and stable uh, prime minister. I also, I also think that there's been an issue with the way she's conducted herself in, in the campaign. Um, people haven't been very impressed. She's, she's 
rejected an awful lot of interviews. She's the first um, the first prime minister in in a great deal of years to um, not appear on Radio Two, which is one of the biggest radio stations in the country. Uh, she refused to kind of debate uh, head to head with the other party leaders in a debate. And she's kind of been seen as hiding, and she's been. And when she has appeared in front of the camera, she's been awfully robotic. Rolled out these 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 kind of pre-rehearsed lines, and I think that's really ground voters down. Even even within her own party, people have been very very disappointed with with her campaign. So I'd say it's a combination of those two factors have have seen her majority wane. That said, you know the most recent polls still put her on head put her ahead, and it might not be the hundred or 150 seats that people were initially predicting, but. Uh, it still looks like she's going to win a, a fairly solid majority. All right, let's go to Mandy Clark, also in London. Mandy, you've been out and about in the streets covering those terror attacks and now covering the election. Uh, what is the sentiment when it comes to Theresa May, specifically with the Conservatives? What is public opinion there in terms of other candidates there? Is she well-liked? Do we think she'll get a landslide victory, or is it still too early to tell? Well, I, I'm certainly not placing any bets on uh, on if uh, there's going to be a majority or a hung parliament or or an upset. But um, overall, the mood when I've spoken to people, um, it, you don't get an overwhelming sense that Theresa May is charismatic and is winning over people. Um, the, even you get a sense in many ways people are choosing the best of of a bad lot. The, the, neither side seems to have won over the majority of the population. Of course, there's um, supporters on both sides, but the, the, the average person um, is, doesn't seem overly convinced by either uh, Jeremy Corbyn or Theresa May. Um, and pointing to the, the her inability to really connect with people, she does seem very stilted. And that has, that has um, in many ways, made her less of a sellable item, but um, you're not getting a sense of a blue backlash either. There's not vitriol dislike for her on the streets. It seems uh, muted, really. All right, let me go back to Alan. Alan, you're in New Delhi uh, talking to uh, presumably some of the uh, expats and uh, uh, folks here in India. What is their sentiment when it comes to this election? Certainly we've seen the surprises around the world when it came to Brexit last year, when Donald Trump won the U.S. presidency. What about for the UK elections? Perception from offshore, um, I think, is very clearly that the expected that Theresa May will win and will win an increased majority. Uh, I actually accept what's been said about the fact that she stumbled during the campaign, and frankly, Jeremy Corbyn has run a much better and more effective campaign than anyone expected. So the polls have closed, uh, have, have um, tightened. However, all polls still suggest that the Tories will win, uh, and all polls suggest that the Tories will win an increased majority. That said, of course, the polls have been wrong in the past, so um, it's another night of fun and games in, in British electoral politics. Certainly an interesting development there. The polls are not always reflecting how accurately the conditions are, which is certainly the case how the U.S. elections were. Let me go back quickly to uh, Mandy. Mandy, you were in the ground there on uh, in New York covering the, uh, uh, the Clinton versus Trump election, and it certainly was a surprise. It looks like the polls were wrong, and uh, people didn't really expect a Trump win. Could we see history repeat itself when it comes to the U.K.? What... How accurate are those uh, those polling numbers, at, at least in the UK uh, uh, perspective, from previous elections? Well, uh, we we can absolutely expect a surprise because polling numbers have been wrong, definitely in the UK as well. Um, not just Brexit. In the previous election, when David Cameron won a majority, um, the the polls had put it a much tighter race. Uh, so. Um, UK pollsters are seem no better than US pollsters. They say they have changed the way they conduct polling that is more accurate, but we'll only know if that's true or not by tomorrow morning. Garrett, let me also ask you a question earlier. You pointed out about young voters perhaps being apathetic, or typically the young voters are not uh, the ones uh, heading to the polls. Uh, why is that the case? Has there been any kind of uh, momentum by either of the parties to attract uh, a younger vote? I don't think that's a recent phenomenon. I think it's traditional. It's kind of been, you know, young turnout. It's fairly constant throughout British elections for the last 50, 60 years. Um, but it's always been kind of acknowledged, um, if not openly, but certainly behind closed doors, that if a party could tap into that, that sentiment, 
um, then there's there's a potentially a lot of votes um, available there. But you know, yeah, as you say, you know, this is something Jeremy Corbyn certainly has tried to tap into to to this young vote, um, and he's he's brought in a, a, a whole swathe of kind of youth friendly policies to do with education, educational grants, um, these sorts of things. Um, and, and you know he has been ha holding big big rallies, and he's got a very very vocal supportive base. Um, but at the same time, it would be very wrong for him to kind of take that that for granted in in any way. Uh, um, there's been kind of criticisms that maybe Jeremy Corbyn hasn't reached out from people who should traditionally support him. He hasn't tried to reach across the dis divide and win over floating voters. Um, and you know those efforts that he has has made to reach out. Uh, beyond his base have, have, have been to young voters. All right, let me go over to Mandy really quickly. And as we wrap up this discussion, talk about the world impact on whoever ends up securing the position. How are the uh, world impacts going to be in, in terms uh, of uh, how the UK is going to be a sort of a building relationships going forward, no matter who uh, wins that seat? Well, I think uh, I think there'd be immediate impact if there is that upset. Um, we might see a dip in the markets um, with a Corbyn win just because of the level of uncertainty that he would bring as a prime minister. Um, but of course, even after Brexit, there was a big dip, um, but it, it evened out, even though it hasn't been back to uh, its original figures. Um, as relationships with the rest of the world, well, Corbyn has been uh, vocally um, um, against some of the, what uh, Donald Trump has said and he was, uh, has been very willing to criticize him, so it might be a strained relationship with the United States. He hasn't been really seen as a main political figure, um, so it's difficult to know how he would fare on the international stage. He is seen very much um, as a fringe candidate, so um, I have no doubt the rest of, rest of world leaders would welcome him and support him, and it would be really up to him to build those relationships. But he uh, certainly has put um, a focus on Britain and warmer relationships with the European Union um, and that soft Brexit rather than the hard one that Theresa May is going for. All right, Alan, same question to you in terms of the world impact and the relationships with the, U, the new UK leader. How do we expect that to go, depending on who wins? Well, I mean, I, I think the central scenario is that Theresa May is going to come back as prime minister. I think the first thing she will have to do is immediately uh, engage with the Brexit discussions. And in parallel with that, she must begin to develop an outreach to other parts of the world to develop new trade relationships. And frankly, sitting in India, it's a huge opportunity for India to forge a new and deeper relationship with the UK. The UK, of course, is going to have to do something on the issue of visas, which is a critical issue on the Indian agenda, uh, in order to secure uh, new trade relations between the UK and India. But it's, from an Indian point of view, this is an opportunity. All right, and really quickly, let me go to Gareth. Same question to you as we wrap this up. Gareth, uh, the world impacts on the new UK leader. Last thoughts. Yeah, I think Theresa May is likely to continue doing what she has been doing. So we'll, the UK will probably remain a silent partner to, to Trump. Um, and, and we're certainly, you know, in, a, in terms of a Middle Eastern perspective, we, we'll, we'll see the UK remain quite quiet when it comes to what's going on in, in the uh, Persian Gulf at the minute. But, uh, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, were he to win this shock upset, would be, that would, this would be a real upset for the international community. He's likely to rebuke Donald Trump quite, quite heavily. Um, he's likely to rebuke some of our some of the Britain's allies in in the Middle East. So um, I think if if Theresa May wins the election, which I'm fully expecting her to do so, uh, British foreign policy is going to kind of bumble along the same way it has over the last few years. But certainly, as your other guests pointed out, uh, Brexit is will present a, a huge opportunity for for India and for other South Asian countries to, to kind of renew and redefine their relationship with Britain. So so plenty of opportunity there. All right. Thank you to all of our guests for this insightful discussion. Still another seven hours or so to go in the UK until polls close. Thank you to Gareth Brown, Mandy Clark, as well as Alan Rosling. Don't forget tonight at eight o'clock on India Prime, an in-depth discussion about Brexit and terrorism. And at nine on Gravitas, we'll go in-depth on the big picture and all the hot button issues. Time now for a quick short break. We'll be right back.
UK votes post-Brexit. Will Britain vote Theresa May back to power, or will Jeremy Corbyn pull off a surprise? Watch UK elections result day. Special broadcast starts 6 a.m. Friday, only on We Are.